So I, I find myself most tempted to call down curses on my neighbors when I'm standing in line at the Market Basket deli counter. <laughs> There's never less than five times as many people waiting in line as there are deli workers. Uh, usually I, I just look at the glowing number, now serving, number 17, pull a number from the ticker, you are number 89, <laughs> and decide that maybe I can just forget to get the sliced turkey this trip. Whoops. <clears throat> Sometimes, though, you let yourself give in to, to hope or hubris. Uh, glowing number 23, your number 27, this is doable. Uh, sure, there's only one deli worker, and they've clearly been working for 10 hours, but all I need is a half pound of sliced turkey. This is, this is doable. Look, we're already at Mr. number 26, and he's ordering now. Now, I consider myself a pacifist. Um, <laughs> I also generally think of myself as pretty easygoing. I don't get road rage, you know, stuff happens. So I, I don't know where those feelings come from. Uh, I, when, when Mr. 26 says, oh, and uh, uh, I'll also get a, a half pound of salami. And um, one more thing, uh, uh, a pound of ham. Is it the, is it the combination of the the fluorescent lighting, the, the pre-dinner hunger, the, the chaos of the parking lot that, that all sort of blend together to set up these feelings of just pure rage when he moves on to his cheese orders. Uh, to quote Psalm 69, let his table become a snare before him. And that which should have been for his welfare, let it become a trap. Okay, so I, I embellish a, a little bit here. I wasn't silently raining curses down on this man's head for ordering sliced Swiss cheese at a deli counter, though who does that? Um, I, I did think that it was remarkable, though, that it's such a banal daily experience that is the closest I get towards anger towards my enemies. Not many of us have enemies. Um, and not all of us have experienced real violence. Because of that, I usually skim the, the imprecatory psalms, um, the ones that curse, imprecatio. It's Latin, literally calling down curses. Um, I tend to fall short of blot out their names from the book of life. Uh, for me, this just feels like oil and water with the New Testament, uh, with the parable of the Good Samaritan, with love thy neighbor. So I usually just choose to drink the water, kind of just ignore the oil. <clears throat> but I took some time with these the last few weeks. Uh, my conclusion is that these cursing, call down violence psalms are actually psalms that end up affirming love thy neighbor, which is weird. Um, let's dig into this a bit. Uh, I'm going to read uh, Psalm 69. It's a classic example. Um, so good, in fact, that uh, Bernard Anderson, a theologian who specialized in the Old Testament, said, it is surely proper to question whether all 150 psalms should be retained in Christian worship. Psalm 69 is almost impossible to use in Christian worship. Challenge accepted. Uh, you can find Psalm 69 on page 413 of your pew Bibles if you want to read along. I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation, so it's going to be a little bit different from what you see there. Um, try, to, try to listen for what I'm talking about. <clears throat> Save me, O oh God, for the flood waters are up to my neck. Deeper and deeper I sink into the mire. I can't find a foothold. I'm in deep water, and the floods overwhelm me. I'm exhausted from crying for help. My throat is parched. My eyes are swollen with weeping, waiting for my God to help me. Those who hate me without cause outnumber the hairs on my head. Many enemies try to destroy me with lies, demanding that I give back what I didn't steal. Oh God, you know how foolish I am. My sins cannot be hidden from you. Don't let those who trust in you be ashamed because of me, O oh sovereign Lord of heaven's armies. Don't let me cause them to be humiliated, O oh God of Israel. For... 
I endure insults for your sake. Humiliation is written all over my face. Even my own brothers pretend they don't know me. They treat me like a stranger. Passion for your house has consumed me, and the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. When I weep and fast, they scoff at me. When I dress in burlap to show sorrow, they make fun of me. I am the favorite topic of town gossip, and all the drunks sing about me. But I keep praying to you, Lord, hoping this time you will show me favor. In your unfailing love, O God, answer my prayer with your sure salvation. Rescue me from the mud. Don't let me sink any deeper. Save me from those who hate me and pull me from these deep waters. Don't let the floods overwhelm me or the deep waters swallow me or the pit of death devour me. Answer my prayers, O Lord, for your unfailing love is wonderful. Take care of me, for your mercy is so plentiful. Don't hide from your servant. Answer me quickly, for I am in deep trouble. Come and redeem me. Free me from my enemies. You know of my shame, scorn, and disgrace. You see all that my enemies are doing. Their insults have broken my heart, and I am in despair. If only one person would show some pity, if only one would turn and comfort me, but instead they give me poison for food. They offer me sour wine for my thirst. Let the bountiful table set before them become a snare and their prosperity become a trap. Let their eyes go blind so they cannot see and let their backs be bent forever. Pour out your fury on them. Consume them with your burning anger. Let their homes become desolate and their tents be deserted. To the one you have punished, they add insult to injury. They add to the pain of those you have hurt. Pile their sins up high and don't let them go free. Erase their names from the book of life. Don't let them be counted among the righteous. I am suffering and in pain. Rescue me, O God, by your saving power. Then I will praise God's name with singing and I will honor him with thanksgiving. For this will please the Lord more than sacrificing cattle, more than presenting a bull with its horns and hooves. The humble will see their God at work and be glad. Let all who seek God's help be encouraged, for the Lord hears the cries of the needy. He does not despise his imprisoned people. Praise him, O heaven and earth, the seas and all that move in them. For God will save Jerusalem and rebuild the towns of Judah. His people will live there and settle in their own land. The descendants of those who obey him will inherit the land, and those who love him will live there in safety. Whew. There's, a, there's a lot there, and it's, it's uncomfortable even to, to read it out loud like I was doing just now, to, to say those things, to wish those things on others. Um, let's talk about this at a high level just for a moment. The, the poetry is striking, even though the language is so stark. Um, for Ken Barnes, who loves the KJV, here's one of the verses in that translation, verse 15. Let not the water flood overflow me, neither let the deep swallow me up, and let not the pit shut her mouth upon me. There's a lot of watery imagery there that feels very appropriate to me in acting as a metaphor for times of overwhelming distress. Overwhelming is a great word to describe it. To overwhelm is to submerge. The first there, the waters are up to my neck. We know what that feels like, uh, like when you're in water that goes up to your chin and you're, you're bouncing on one toe to keep your mouth above the, the waves. That's, that's what distress, what stress feels like to me. It's an emotionally honest and poignant psalm. It's also a brutal psalm. Let their eyes go blind let their backs be bent forever. Let their homes become desolate. Erase their names in the book of life. Uh, there's nothing guarded here in the psalmist's desire for the punishment they want done to these people, their enemies. So how do we read this? How do we interpret it? Uh, there's, that's certainly my question every time I come to it, uh, every time I, I read it and come across psalms like this one. Um, and I think there's at least three different ways, and I'm gonna kind of walk through those. So... Number one, we just take it at face value. Perhaps the most obvious option, um, the Psalms in general, they offer homes for the emotional places that we live in throughout different parts of our lives. Um, there are Psalms of rejoicing, like what Paul read in our call to worship. Uh, there are Psalms of mourning 
And this is a psalm of a call to justice, a psalm asking the Lord to mete out his judgment. This is very hard for me. Um, I, I can't claim that I've ever experienced deep injustice. I've never been invaded or persecuted. And it's really difficult for me to sincerely wish violence to come to others. But there are certainly people today uh, in this world for whom the psalm holds a deeply relevant resonance and significance. Um, there was a video going around a couple of months ago uh, of Ukrainians, of Jews and Christians together uh, reading Psalm 31. That's a, a very similar psalm in parts, which says, uh, rescue me quickly, be my rock of protection, a fortress where I will be safe. It also says in that same psalm, let the wicked be disgraced, let them lie silent in the grave. Um, I have to think that the image of a city under siege uh, is particularly poignant to the Ukrainians. I, I wonder whether the sections of refuge uh, were more calming or, or whether it was the calls for retribution. I don't know. I, I don't know if a focus on retribution brings peace, and I don't think I can call that reading of an imprecatory psalm incorrect um, when taken as a voice given to pain. Uh, at the very least, it's emotionally honest because there can and will be times in our lives that we feel wronged and we call out for justice. Um, but I do think it can be myopic, can be short-sighted to read Psalm 69, let their eyes go blind, from the perspective that this is God's long-term plan for justice. Uh, we risk that in this sort of call to justice reading approach. We can ignore the vision of the kingdom of God in Revelation where the lion lies down with the lamb if we believe that this psalm will be a home for our emotions forever, uh, that there will be a continual cycle of injustice followed by God's retribution. I think about God's covenant promise, which we hear in 2 Samuel 7, uh, which Paul read, your house and your kingdom will continue before me for all time and your throne will be secure forever. And I, I will raise up one of your descendants, your own offspring, and I will make his kingdom strong, and I will secure his royal throne forever. Forever. So basically, if we focus only on calling for God's immediate justice, we neglect to remember that he has promised his justice. He has promised redemption, and he has fulfilled his promise through Jesus Christ, who has conquered death and will redeem all things. There's certainly a, a time and place to spill out emotion when the flood waters are up to your neck. And we will and have experienced this. Uh, but imprecation alone won't save us. And in an extreme case, we, we risk weaponizing the Psalms when we read them in this way. Okay, so approach number one, literally reading this as a call to justice can, can fall short and miss the covenantal promise. Um, what about another approach? So I call approach two, baptizing the psalm. Um, and I think this is the first instinct of many people when they come to psalms like this. Uh, basically leaning in the opposite direction from everything that I was just talking about. Saying things like, well, it was a violent time, but look at God's covenant and, and the fulfillment of that covenant in Jesus. All this, this cursing, maybe it's allegory, it's, it's metaphor. Uh, why not, for example, reclassify enemies? Um, if we're putting on the, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the shield of faith that Paul talks about in Ephesians, then maybe we should take enemies here to mean the evils in our hearts, uh, deceit, greed, lust, idolatry. These are the enemies that as Christians we face today, uh, and they're the internal enemies. And most importantly to remember, Jesus has conquered sin and death, and ultimately that sets us free from those enemies, offers us a way out. At face value, I think that this too can be a deeply meaningful reading of Psalm 69 for many people. Um, I'm going to read actually the last stanza of that psalm. Um, it's, it's a hard left turn towards positivity, and you might have caught it when I, was, when I was reading it. And that's in part why this psalm in particular stood out to me. So after all that cursing, it goes to, Praise him, O heaven and earth, the seas and all that move in them, for God will save Jerusalem and rebuild the towns of Judah. Uh, those who love him will live there in safety. Complete 180 from the curses in the, in the first part of the psalm. This is a, a direct reference in my eyes to the covenantal promise. 
this year says that there will in fact be justice and there will be resolution. The approach of focusing more on the ending here is, is I'm calling it a baptized reading of this psalm, which pushes aside the curses and points towards the ultimate reality of redemption, uh, which thanks to the New Testament we can fully articulate. But it is a little watered down, this, this way of doing it, isn't it? To, to look past the whole enemy part. Um, I looked at the imprecatory psalms in part because I wondered if they had more relevance in a time of war and conflict. Um, the freshening up of this psalm in light of the fulfilled covenant, it's, it is a truthful perspective, but it's probably not going to be palliative to someone who's actively being persecuted. It might be too farsighted, if I can sort of wrangle that term, to force feed this allegory of internal evil to someone whose home has just been taken away. I think that with this baptized reading, we perhaps can risk going too far and ignoring the conditions which required God's covenant with man in the first place. Sin and evil really does exist in this world and not just internally. We encounter broken people in our time on earth and we encounter the evil that sprouts from that, the systematic evil that sprouts from that collective brokenness. War and poverty are systems that we feed into. To focus only on the truth of God's story of redemption is to weaken the power of this psalm to minister to the truly broken, to not acknowledge their current reality. These two approaches perhaps are two most common when we read this psalm in many ways boiled down to the tension between focusing on the current reality and the future reality which is promised. If we focus only on current struggles and enemies, we deny Christ's power to break that cycle. If we focus only on Christ's breaking of that cycle, we may ignore the need that required that sacrifice, which we still grapple with today. So, third approach, rhetorical question, why can't we do both? Try to balance those two. Seems kind of an obvious choice. And rhetorically, it seems like what I've been leading up to. Um, <clears throat> well, it's really hard to, to do that. Let, let's try it for a moment. So, Think of something genuinely challenging in your life, and, and you can close your eyes if you have to, that's fine. Maybe it's a challenging relationship that just doesn't resolve. Um, maybe it's something hard that's happened to you recently or, or, or not so recently. If you can't think of one of those things, maybe it's just something that you're really not looking forward to today. In thinking about that challenge, try for a moment to be both a winner and a loser in this situation. So what, what I mean by that is try now to feel that you've been deeply wronged by that situation, unfairly so. Um, at the same time, holding on to that, that first feeling of being deeply wronged, feel that it's going to be all right. The good will out, regardless of your role. Feel that, of course, there will be justice. Both at the same time. Okay. This is almost impossible, and, and I agree with you completely if that's what you're thinking right now. Um, even more impossible knowing that the truly challenging, painful things in our lives deeply wound us to the point where it was maybe an incredible battle to get to that point of resolution, or we still find ourselves in that place of feeling deeply wronged, and we don't see an end to that. My thought is that this is not made easier by the culture that we live in um, here in America. American culture tends to split up winners and losers. Uh, we jokingly say, if you're not first, you're last. Uh, the American dream, in some phrasing, is the belief that you can go from being nothing uh, to being something, from the, from the bottom of the heap to the top of the world. You're not both at the same time. You're not and you can't be. You're, you're happy or you're not. You're certainly not both comfortably secure and actively beset upon by enemies. If I put myself in the mindset of the audience of this song, the Israelites, it gets a little marginally easier to hold the two frames of mind in tension. For them, you gotta remember that success and dominance were closely followed by ruin and exile, and back and forth it went. 
the audience of this psalm was intimately familiar with their tendency to hold firmly to God's covenant promise to make a permanent home with them just long enough to grow complacent and lose everything. The covenant was the thread of promise that held them barely together, but their current circumstances couldn't be denied. It's a really fascinating dual mindset that you read in the Psalms. It's something that's really unfamiliar to us. And it's in others than just Psalm 69. Um, if you let me do one more jumping around in scripture, uh, you see it also in Psalm 56. So you have in one breath, my foes attack me all day long. I am constantly hounded by those who slander me. In the next, you have, I praise God for what he has promised. And then it goes right back to, they're always twisting what I say. They spend their days plotting to harm me. The Israelites were uniquely capable of holding both the current reality and the future promise. Psalm 69 gives us space to express our deep anguish for pain that has been unjustly inflicted on us while also opening the door for us to affirm God's care and plan. This is incredibly hard. I've said that I've often leaned more towards the second, uh, not feeling comfortable with the first. But I have to believe that there will be numerous points in my life where I'll probably end up going back to that first interpretation to give a voice to pain. I read this, though, as God saying that we don't need to be pain-free before coming to him. We're allowed to be very angry and hurt and still hear his promise, hear that hope. The covenant is the deeper, much more lasting truth, which is woven through many of these psalms, not just 69. Uh, those psalms say, come to me, for I will give you hope and life. The imprecatory psalms, like 69, say, come as you are. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, we thank you for this opportunity to <clears throat> reflect on your word and reflect on both um, pain and restoration. Um, for the many people in this room, we all have varied experiences on what those two things uniquely mean to us. Um, we thank you that you don't require us to have simple emotions, um, that we can be deeply complex and flawed and in pain, um, and that your covenant can still be a part of that. Um, please, uh, as we go about our days and we go about our weeks um, and we reflect on um, the challenges and pain and, and brokenness in our lives. Give us patience um, as we seek that restoration, as we seek your covenant, you're making all things new. Um, give, us, give us patience when dealing with that and, and give us the assurance um, that, um, that your covenant and your healing um, can be woven throughout that process. We thank you for all these things in your name. Amen.